Let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Venkatesan Ramachandran. Ken from my team will be joining later today in the presentation. We're going to talk about scaling ETL on Hadoop at LinkedIn. I'll start with the overall data ecosystem at LinkedIn. Then we'll focus on the problem of integrating online data stores with Hadoop. Then we'll, we'll look into the solution we have and finally go into some interesting details. If you see on the top, you see the serving applications. Users interact with the serving applications and they generate actions and cause data mutations. The actions and the data mutations are persisted in log store as well as online data, data stores. And the persistent data is periodically replicated to Hadoop for further analysis and enrichment. Once the data is computed on Hadoop, they get pushed to serving applications as product features. They're also used internally in reports as, you know, to take uh, business insights, and they're predominantly used by analysts. Our log store is Kafka, and on the serving side, we have a whole bunch of online data stores. Espresso is another uh, homegrown, LinkedIn homegrown uh, document-based data store. The computed reports are served using the OLAP serving engines. We do have uh, a bunch of uh, OLAP serving uh, stacks at LinkedIn. Uh, one is a Waldemart key value based one. The other one is Pino, which is uh, based on uh, search technology. And then finally, we have the traditional Teradata MicroStrategy slash Tableau that is used to generate reports uh, that's consumed primarily by uh, data scientists. I want to talk about the data that we deal with at LinkedIn. There are primarily two types of data. One is the tracking data, another one is database data. User act activity at the site turns into tracking data. The tracking data is append only in the sense each user activity generates a new data. And it, it, it is immutable in the sense that once generated, it doesn't change. Examples of uh, tracking data are you know, viewing a page, clicking on an ad, and so forth. Usually, this data is arranged in you know, date partitions on HDFS and accessed by a range of uh, a range, saying that give me last one week's data or give me last couple of hours worth of data. And the database data, this is the data provided by users. For example, think of the member profile that users go and enter in the site. And this is a clean data where a member can add his position or change his position or delete a position. This corresponds to inserts, updates, and deletes on the online data stores. This data is actually available as a full in HDFS. So people consume it, I mean the users on Hadoop, they consume it as a full. And roughly speaking, this data relates to your dimension data in the data warehouse uh, terminology. And the tracking data is roughly translates into your fact data. So we are moving data from uh, the serving systems to Hadoop. So what is the big problem in this? And why is it so critical? As you see, there is about 300 million users and at LinkedIn site and few million job postings and companies, and that causes a lot of data, humongous data. Moving this humongous data is a problem. And the other thing is the data that changes on the online store needs to be there on Hadoop as soon as possible because the freshness, da freshness of the data really impacts the user engagement and thereby the monetization and the business decision making. So it is the scale of the data and the latency at which we want it to be available on Hadoop makes it a challenging problem. 
some numbers in terms of the scalability of data. We have our online data stores in spread across multiple data centers. They are not just in one, one data center, the bunch of data centers. The same way we have few Hadoop clusters comprising of 5,000 nodes spread across multiple data centers. And moving the data from you know, all the online data centers to processing data center is a problem. And we generate roughly about one terabytes, you know, few terabytes, I don't have the exact number, a uh, few terabytes per day, and that needs to be, you know, sort of moved to Hadoop for further en enrichment and, and analysis. The next problem is with consistent snapshot. The thing is, if you see the online data stores, they support insert, updates, and deletes. And for example, a user who enters his profile a month back can come in this morning, change, add a new position, or change his position. That needs to be reflected on HDFS for other computations to take advantage of it. Unfortunately, HDFS doesn't support updates. So the only way you can do is take the whole data and copy it over onto Hadoop. Or if you are a little bit you know, trying to do some optimization, you only find the changes and rewrite the data on, on Hadoop. So either way, it causes a lot of resource overhead, both on the source and the network bandwidth, because we are talking about multiple data centers. And on Hadoop, where you need to run jobs to merge the data back. But if you really look into the pattern in the data, there is only a fraction of the data that changes on a daily basis. I'm talking about the database data, not the tracking data. The tracking data is sort of very straightforward to handle that you get the, the changes and just arrange them um, as append partitions in HDFS. Whereas the database data is the one that you need to go rewrite to, to, to reflect the lot, latest changes. So the data, how do we take advantage of the fact that only a fraction of the data changes, and what do we decide? What, how do we build our solution? So the requirements at a high level, the tracking data and, and database data, they have almost the same requirement, except that the database data ha has a few more requirements. They are, the important ones are, don't overload the source system when you try to take the data out, because the source systems are serving the site. If you overload them, the site is going to cause a uh, lot of latency, and that will affect the user experience. And the last update semantics, what I mean by that is, when the profile has changed 10 times, people on Hadoop want to see the latest updated value. They don't want to see the 10 times, the, the older value, or if it's changed 10 times, they don't want to see the 10, the, the 10 versions of it. They wanted to see the latest version of the data. And this is, this is important in order to do the data quality as well as uh, the query uh, performance. And the deletes is another one where people may go and delete their profiles or positions on, on, on the online system that need to be reflected on Hadoop seamlessly for compliance reasons. Solution. Lumos is a solution, it's a homegrown system that we have at LinkedIn. Going by the Harry Potter naming convention, uh, Lumos is, uh, is a spell in Harry Potter that means there's light. Um, so if you look at the, the system, you have the online uh, databases on one end, and the middle we have something called the data capture systems. And then on the Hadoop end, we have Lumos, which does all the processing. So Databus is a LinkedIn homegrown, it's an open source system that where you can publish change logs through some APIs and you can read them on the other end. Uh, this, is, this works cross colo, roughly speaking, it's a messaging system. So Lumos uh, uses the change logs, database commit logs, uh, as an input, and it consumes the commit logs and plays them back, replays them on HDFS to recreate the snapshot that is same as what is in the online databases. So the important thing is here, the commit logs are transactional, whereas Lumos consumes them as a batch. It doesn't consume each 
commit logs separately, but it batches them. It can batch them like 15 minutes or hourly. Right now we run in hourly batches. So every hour it commits the commit logs and then replace them against HDFS. And it also, what it does is that these commit logs are also surfaced in HDFS as change logs in separate folder in HDFS. So if users are really interested, they can go and look at how many times my profile or some user's profile has changed within a day or how many times he has uh, clicked on likes or comments or something. Um, and also it, it does the last snapshot update, merges all of them and produces the another, another area where you have the last updated value. And the other thing is that important thing to note about is the delta processing. What I mean by delta processing is that it's going to consume only the change logs, not all the logs from the database. Only the change logs, and it's going to consume them from across multiple databases and tables, and multiplexes them, and process it one shot, and demultiplexes the output, and writes them out in the databases folder, so that you have the users don't need to do extra processing. They get the last updated data on HDFS. And this also ensures like low latency, uh, so that once the data changes in the online system, it's available as soon as possible within hours on, or sometimes minutes if we run this in a low, uh, in smaller batches. This one talks about at high level, um, how does it handle uh, multi data, data stores that spread across multiple uh, data centers. We do have Espresso, which is a homegrown uh, data store that spreads across multiple data centers and talks about how it uses a commit order to merge them to find out what is the last update. Let's talk about uh, the data organization. The snapshot, uh, when I talk about the snapshot, I'm not talking about uh, HDFS snapshot or uh, HBase snapshot. This snapshot is nothing but a HDFS folder where you have the content of the online table just dumped on HDFS in set of files. And the directory is arranged such a way there is a database at the top, and then there is a table, and then there is a next path, the next component in the directory is a, a, a version. And this data underneath the snapshot has some latency when you compare with the online databases, maybe a day's old, because it takes so long to take the full dump out of the database and copies over under, under, uh, under the Hadoop directory. Talking about the virtual snapshot, this is the, it's just a snapshot. It has a snapshot and then it has all the deltas since that particular snapshot. What that means is that you have the base data sitting there and then you have all the, the change logs coming in as, as batches and each one of them are processed, put under, you know, in the hidden folder called underscore delta. The directory one will correspond to the first batch of changes. And then after a while, the second hour when the process runs, the second batch of changes go under directory two. The directory two consumes the previous data from directory one and the new data. So it sort of keeps growing. So the, the, the important thing is that this data is accessed via a specialized input format that is supported via uh, hive loaders and uh, ping loaders. And that knows how to read the base data and the latest delta and do a merge sort during runtime and, pro and, and produce the, the exact snapshot. So the changed rows are in really in the directory three. The base data sits in uh, snapshot zero. The input format knows how to merge and pick the latest row from the directory three, if it is present. That's a high level. This is a, a high level architecture. Uh, we have a 
change capture mechanism I talked about. In the absence of a true change capture mechanism, Lumos can work with uh, in terms of uh, files that people periodically run some exports on the database, get the change logs. They are pseudo change logs. They are not commit logs, but they are pseudo change logs. It can process them. And we do have a pre-processing stage, which does a whole bunch of business logic specific things. In order to bootstrap the system, you have to give the full dump at the first, first time. So that is the bootstrapping procedure. The full drops going through a lazy snapshot and gets published as the base snapshot on HDFS. Afterwards, you will, the system, the change capture system will produce increments. And the increments go via virtual snapshot and then they get processed and then published into the virtual snapshot as the delta folders. If anybody wants to read the users, they go through Hive and Pig and MapReduce jobs using the custom loaders. They, they do the uh, merge sort and, and read the data. And periodically we do compact because the deltas will keep growing and periodically there is a compaction job that runs and merges the base snapshot and the latest delta and puts them as a new snapshot. So that's how the overall architecture works. Ken will explain more in detail about each one of the, the green bubbles. At a high level, um, we have, there are some alternatives available and we looked at some of them. Scoop is a popular system that's, uh, that imports and exports data from databases onto HDFS. However, from my understanding, uh, Scoop uses JDBC. Since our databases, online databases, are in different data centers, we cannot really use uh, JDBC to co go across cross colo. So that's really a non-starter for us. And HBase was another option where you could just stream the data into HBase and periodically a make a HD HBase snapshot. That's one option. Or the second option. You can have your hive and pig, uh, you know, read HDFS as well as read HBase. Um, unfortunately, like not every company runs HBase. LinkedIn has, you know, different solutions for serving, so there are different stacks. And uh, HBase is not uh, run as a, as part of the standard deployment at at LinkedIn. Uh, using HBase for this purpose is sort of a overhead. And also, we had questions in terms of um, the, 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 the throughput when we read uh, HBase and H HDFS from a pig script, as well as some questions about latency uh, when we are doing uh, HDFS snapshot. It's not clear whether we can do every hour a HDFS snapshot, so we haven't explored that. And the last option is Hive streaming. What we do is, uh, is sort of a lot of similarities between Hive streaming and what Lumos does. And Lumos is a system that's been in production for close to a year now. And uh, we, we've been learning about Hive streaming very uh, recently. And at a high level, there are two major things that I wanted to highlight. Um, that's, that's a difference between uh, Lumos and Hive streaming. The Lumos is an end-to-end -end that it plugs into uh, your, uh, your change capture system and produces the data. Whereas in Hive streaming, you still need to go and write the, the front end portion that can read from the uh, databases and produce the data, uh, the change logs and push the change logs into, into the Hive. And the second thing is, um, looking at the, the Hive specification, it operates at a table level. Uh, whereas Lumos operates at a database level that it, it consumes all the data from all the databases tables, it processes them as one shot and produces the data output. That really helps us to ensure the latency. In terms of Hive streaming, we need to figure it out how it's going to solve the, the latency part of that. With that, I'm giving to Ken to talk more details about this. Hi, as Ben Kat mentioned, my name is Ken. Uh, I'm an engineer at uh, LinkedIn. And since it's the last talk, I figure anybody who's still awake after seeing the word details, your stamina should be commended. But jumping right in here, 
actually, that goes the wrong way. So as Venkat already kind of covered at a high level how some of these things work, we're going to dig down just a little bit, not for very long, but just a little bit, and talk about how we get data from production. As Venkat mentioned, our production uh, colos and our corp colos are in a different fabric, uh, so we can't hit them directly to query out changes. And so our DBAs will make extracts from our Oracle tables and present them as compressed CSV files. They produce two kinds of extracts. One is a what we call a full drop, and the other is an incremental pull. The full drop uh, from Oracle is produced via a tool called FastReader. Now, FastReader does a dirty read of the actual data on disk. Uh, it is very much a dirty read. Uh, the fast reader can run for several hours to extract a rather large table, and during that time, any records that are updated, you won't be sure which version you get. Um, for Espresso, we use MySQL backups to uh, get the uh, full extract from that. For the incremental pulls for Oracle, uh, basically it's just a SQL query. Uh, give me all, select all star records from the last known high water mark repeat that at a certain interval, so every hour you'll get more, you know, the records that change within that hour. This works pretty well for, then we take those records and apply them to the dirty read and basically make the dirty read clean. Uh, the only thing it doesn't work well for is hard deletes. Um, and for that reason, we will on, for tables that have hard deletes, uh, first off, we try to get them changed to soft deletes. But if that's not possible, then we do routine um, uh, reads with fast reader in order to remove those, um, resync up the production and remove those extra records. Now for Espresso, we have Databus, Venkat mentioned earlier, um, which is an open source project. And that does give us the true change log with hard deletes and everything. So in that case, it's a little simpler. Um, we don't need to continually resync with production um, and we get all the tables updated. So now that we have the data, once we have it, we do a little bit of pre-processing. For the Oracle extracts, uh, they come to us as flat files. We convert those into Avro. And uh, we do a little metadata annotation. Uh, we want to know if it's a full read, uh, what time it ran, so that we can apply the appropriate uh, deltas to it. Um, we also want to know row counts that we'll use later for downstream um, verification that we have all the data. And as far as field level transformations, we try to avoid doing any changes. We want the data to be a true representation of what's in production. But there are cases where, for privacy reasons, we do need to mask something out or remove it. And also, too, there can be technical reasons. Uh, many downstream processes, like PIG and Hive, do not handle recursive scheme as well, so we may flatten that out so that everyone's able to read the data. Now, the full drops that we mentioned um, earlier, the dirty reads we were talking about, we need to get those ready to have the delta changes applied to them. And we do that with a job we call lazy materializer. The reason it's lazy is it can be scheduled whenever, it doesn't have to, as soon as we get a full drop from production, we don't have to process it right away. If it's uh, bootstrapping a table initially, we don't want to schedule it over updating all the existing tables. We want to make sure the existing stuff is updated first. If it is just resyncing to production, once again, we don't want that scheduling to overwhelm the cluster and the updated increments not to come out. So we say it's lazy because we can basically just run it when it's convenient. Uh, the lazy materializer will take the data, hash partition on the primary key, and this is the primary key from the source system. Uh, and it, the number of partitions is based on the data size, and within those partitions, the data is all sorted based on that primary key. From there, the results are pushed into staging, and then the next job will uh, pick that up. So, oh, again, that's one, MapReduce job per table for the uh, lazy process, the process of full dumps. For the delta changes, we have the virtual snapshot builder, and Venkat already described what a virtual snapshot is. But for this, we have one single Hadoop job that 
Um, prior to the jobs, uh, during the setup, it will scan the published data for all existing snapshots. It will look at the staging directory to see what new snapshots are available. And then it will look at the change log or the pseudo change log and determine what records need to be applied to each one of those snapshots um, in front of several hundred tables and create the appropriate delta um, partition files for every one of those. Once it's created those, uh, it publishes the stage snapshots with the necessary deltas to uh, turn the dirty read into a clean read. And the previous snapshots that have already been published will be updated with new delta directories so that the table's been refreshed. So you, a little bit, so I saw this earlier, um, showing kind of a little bit how the directory structure is laid out. We have a snapshot here um, with, for this uh, example, 10 partition files. These are the typical, you know, you have 10 reducers, you get 10 files. Underneath that directory is a hidden directory we call underscore delta. And inside there, there's several versions of a delta directory. And inside each one of those is a number of files that is used to update the existing snapshot. Those files combine several parts. Since the data is smaller, we combine several partitions into as few files as possible. We shoot for about half a gig, and we predict up front how big that's going to be. And so in this case here, we see that the uh, delta had two uh, partition files in it, and each one of them contained five partitions. And there's an index file to let the reader know which part of that delta file to read to, to read that partition. Within that delta partition, um, the records have been sorted by the same primary key as the snapshot, and so the loaders can then read both streams in parallel, um, basically do a merge sort at the end of the merge sort. Yeah, there, there, there's no uh, complexity here. It's just order n going over both streams. And as it reads the delta stream, it, uh, if there's a record present in it that's newer than the snapshot, it returns it. If the record in the delta stream indicates that this record's been deleted, it masks it. Or if it's just in the snapshot, it's returned. We've uh, created. Uh, Loaders for standard MapReduce, uh, a pig loader, and a storage handler for Hive. And real quickly here, um, as explained uh, a little bit ago, um, the loader, in this case, reading the partition zero, would uh, read partition zero out of the delta directory. Uh, the index file tells exactly what it needed to read, and mapper 9 here would have read partition 9, and actually partition 5 from the delta file, since the index file lets it know that it contains uh, partitions 5 through 9. Lastly, um, if you, the deltas keep growing in size. So every delta contains all the changes since the snapshot. We made this decision to do this because we didn't want to have end users launch a reader that potentially could be reading hundreds of files at one time. The delta files are non-local. Uh, it's very hard to get locality with them and with the snapshot. So we only want the reader to open up two files max, the snapshot and the delta files. So each one contains all the records, they continue to grow, and so at some time point we need to compact that into the original um, snapshot files. And that's the compactor phase. It basically uses the same loaders that anyone else would use, reads the file. Um, if, if it decides that it doesn't need to do any kind of repartitioning, then it's just a map only job, uh, reads it through, produces the same number of files. Um, if it detects that the files are gonna get too large, um, it will put a reducer phase on that and repartition the data. And then the next time the VSB job sees it, it will create new delta files that match the new partitioning. So, kind of issues we ran into with operating this is a lot of times people want to know where their data is at. Uh, they may be looking at um, an incorrect version. Uh, they may have thought something was written in production and it wasn't, but they come to you and want you to uh, figure out where the data is. This is where it's really important to have good data validation um, so that 
when somebody says, hey, I think this table is missing some data. Uh, most of the time you can go out in production, hey, can you guys query this, let us know there, if that data is there. But it's really good to have good quality checks to know that your data is matching production. And right now, a lot of our checks rely upon row count. So if somebody says a record's missing, you know, production says it has a million records. Our checks on our end say we have a million records. Uh, we um, make sure that, that the times line up. Uh, so it's very important to have that. Um, if somebody one time said to me, you can have the greatest pipeline in the world, but if you don't have a check that proves it, who cares? Um, another issue we've uh, had to figure out, you know, work with is how we handle late data coming in. Late data can be data that was missed, needs to go out and be put into the Delta files and update the snapshot, or it could be some kind of replay going on, and we definitely don't want that new data to be replacing our old data. So there's a bit of a balancing here where we have to make two. What we basically do is we go back and make sure that anything newer than the full drop, the full read, uh, are, is included. But anything older than that, if we're just replaying a lot of old data, um, isn't, isn't brought in. Uh, ideally, if you could go back in time forever and make sure you caught everything, it would be great. But that's not always practical. And lastly, uh, cluster downtime. So, at, our, uh, at LinkedIn, about once a week, uh, they will take down the cluster for maintenance, rolling out new upgrades and things like that. And we want to make sure that if Lumos is killed in the middle of any of the jobs, uh, when we restart it, it does the right thing. Um, so it has to be very item potent. The best way you achieve that is, is you make sure that nothing is committed until it's actually done. And if something was in the middle, you just discard it, start from the previous point, and get going. And we've never really had an issue of uh, the cluster going down in the middle of a run causing a problem. So uh, we rolled Lumos out last year. Um, it's worked very well. Uh, the, since then, the data has done the normal. More tables, more records, more bytes. Uh, but our actual delivery SLAs have not moved hardly at all. Uh, we originally. We're getting data out by a certain time. It, we're still getting it out by that time, which is a good thing. Uh, and um, the work that we really need to do now is that we we spoke a little bit about how the data came in, you know, through fast reader and things like that. We want to really unify that internal ingestion with our external ingestion to make sure that as we bring data sources in from the outside that we annotate them correctly so that Lumos can understand what the data is, uh, what it needs to do with it, so that all the data sets can uh, take advantage of this. And of course, open sourcing. So any questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. In this case, what is the range? You, you still have the usage before the data is actually used. So, the yeah. usage here should be sort of you know, free and to use the, the exact data set. Uh, our data team is like sort of maybe a bit in a, an arc because it's all kind of data which is coming pulling in. So, a day at least is how it works. So, we do it daily. What is your latency? Yes, yeah, so. For different tables, um, there'll be different ones that have different requirements. And the DBAs uh, have some control over when they decide to do their extracts. And so if there's some tables that people do want to see uh, very soon after midnight, because they want the entire uh, previous day's changes. And our DBAs will uh, make sure that they're pulled around midnight. Um, they, we see them fairly quickly. And we usually have them out within an hour. Uh, other tables will be if, if the database on the front end is on a four-hour cycle, and they don't want to continue to be uh, querying for changes because that puts load on it. So they might have a four-hour cycle. And so even though we've got to where we can handle it within an hour, um, we still have to deal with the fact that they can't query it that fast. That, that, is, that is what we're referring to. Uh, a lot of this work was kind of viewed as the first half of getting the problem solved. Of if, if you could get the data to us really fast, could we actually publish it? And prior to this, the answer was no. Uh, 
Now we feel like we solved that part. Yes, if you got the data to us really fast, we can publish, publish it really fast. Then, then comes the work of, well, now let's figure out how to get the data really fast. Just a little bit more changes to that, um, <clears throat> which is, uh, as Ken mentioned, so there is a, from Oracle database tables, where there is no true change capture available, there is a DBS run the queries periodically and then send it to us through files. So they are pseudo change logs. But we have a huge footprint of uh, some internally, internal technology called Espresso, which is based on MySQL. And uh, it looks into the MySQL change logs, the bin logs. So that is a true change capture system. So where the data that changes on the MySQL, that is Espresso, uh, which, is, which actually powers the uh, site-facing applications. Anything that changes over there um, is available as a transaction. And that da data comes in um, as in batches like 15 minutes if you wanted to consume them. Uh, right now we are consuming them once an hour. But we can you know, dial down and start consuming that every 15 minutes and then run our processing. We really optimized our processing so it can run every 15 minutes. So if the input starts coming in 15 minute batches and the whole processing takes about 15 minutes and within like 30 minutes we have the data. So, so in, in, in places where we have true cam uh, raw commit log change based change capture, we do use that. And there are some legacy systems where some of the applications run on Oracle where we really cannot do the change capture. Golden Gate is an option, but unfortunately, go tell your DBA enable supplemental logging on it, and, and, and there you go. The transformations, uh, in the sense, we, we showed you the pre-processing, where you know compliance will come to us and say, uh, I really wanted to transform this field. I really wanted to take these fields out. Okay? And there are some mucking around they wanted to do. And every time, we don't want to go and write code. And so it's a, they, they, they provide them as set of a configs, and they get pushed into the system. And they work. And the way why we call this is a framework in the sense, you don't need to set up a configuration or install anything uh, for each database or table. You just point to the production database, and it works for everything. So in terms of, it's called a framework because in terms of operational overhead, that there is a zero operational overhead for bringing in a new database or a table or anything. So it's typically a replicate of all the components. Yep, right. One last question from my side. The problem that we have is one thing is the data. Uh, for example, we replicate a lot of data from like uh, packaged applications to single replication and other, other applications where we have three hundred columns in a row but we want to use like 25 or 50 of them, right? Then we replicate the rest of the data between that three. So what we do is we do TV tables where we do a secondary job to create another hash table that the rest of the HDFS will pass as well. So you, you don't do a pre-processing or that is part of the way to have it done in your HDFS and the further processing. We don't have a lot of tables where we do do that. Um, the big reason is, is that we have a lot of end users, and one team may have said, hey, I only need these 20 fields. We're not going to go then change the process because another team says, oh, and I need an additional 10 fields. Uh, space is, of course, always an issue, but um, we, right now the database data is not something that we have too much of an issue with replicating. Tr uh, tracking data takes up way more space than any of that. So it, database is not the first thing people look at for saving space. So for that solution, we could probably explore some column store. You know, you write into Parquet or something like that, or Arc. Uh, but we haven't, uh, we, we've been exploring it, but it's, it's not, not there yet. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, yes. It's virtual in the sense that, so prior, in our first version of Lumos, uh, 
it was a full snapshot whenever we got new changes in. So pull in uh, some amount of new changes, reshuffle the entire table, reproduce it, and we called that a snapshot shotting of the table. This one now um, is intended to give you the same results, but actually not re-snapshot the table in its entirety, just re-snapshot the delta changes since the one that sits there. So the snapshot itself may be three days old, uh, but the delta changes um, provide the updates, and the end user doesn't need to know about any of this. If they use the correct loader, uh, they just point at the table, read it, and it's updated as of a few hours ago. To them, it seems like it's the updated table, but they don't have to. Uh, so you don't make a switch until? You don't rewrite the data. No, the we, we, we avoid rewriting the data as much as possible. Right. So that saves uh, resources on Hadoop. Uh, both the deltas and the snapshot um, are partitioned the same way, and they're sorted the same way. So you read both of them serially and just emit the correct record as you go. Uh, so the users do not uh, deal with the delta directly. They go through the input format. The, uh, map, if they're writing a MapReduce program, there is an input format available to them. If they are writing pig scripts, there is a separate pig loader that we, call, we have, and then Hive, they are registered as storage handlers. In, in their pick script, they will use that particular uh, loader, and then the loader underneath does the merging, that the Ken was explaining, the, the, the merging underneath. So it's transparent to the users. They don't need to worry about this. So the merge activity will scan that partition that is not shared? I, yes. These are, these are files on HDFS, so it, basically everything's a linear scan. Um, even if you're using Hive or something like that. Yes? So you described it, but then did you ever need to do a full spread on the HDFS file or did you need to do something from a full spread file? Since the deltas will continue to grow, you, you do eventually want to do a refresh. Uh, the nice thing is, is now you can do it on a schedule that works for you, whereas before you had to do it on the schedule of when people needed it. So. Everybody wants to look at data at 1 a.m. or 4, 3 a.m. Everybody wants to run their jobs at that exact same time. So this is the time that you don't want to be trying to reshuffle and refresh the entire data set. But later in the day, uh, fewer people are trying to do that same kind of work. Um, so cluster time is a little cheaper. No, we are using Apache. We don't use any of the distribution. We just take the Apache and then, yeah. Our ops team uh, just builds the uh, distribution for us. Yeah, so 1.134? 1. What? 1, 2, 1. There you go. And uh, we're just now starting to experiment with uh, 2.3, 2.4. Yeah. But a lot as far as the consistency goes, we we don't publish anything until we verify that it had the right number of records and all that. Everything in the meantime is written to temporary directories. If anything goes away, the temporary directories are ignored and processing is started from the beginning. Uh, we use broke counts too. So basically in, in production, they'll do a query as of a certain watermark. Um, how many records does the table contain? And then they'll provide us those records as well. Uh, we apply those changes and only those changes and then we count. And if the counts match, we're good. Um, if they don't, it's reported as where we're off. 
Uh, we haven't actually implemented anything that does a query as of yet because the one difficulty we have is, is that we translate the data into Avro and there's a few things. Oracle doesn't have any kind of, it's just number. Uh, so you don't know if it's a long, uh, you can tell if people have set the precision and the scale and all that, figure out exactly if they're holding the double or anything like that, but not everybody does that because in the end number will hold just about anything. So, you know, there's some translation of the data that is unavoidable and then trying to, you know, match back, say is this the same as production can be a little tricky. We, uh, we're just now in the process of uh, making soft deletes official all over. Uh, for the tables that already had it, it is transparent to the end user. However, we're standardizing that now and it will no longer be. Um, but there will be change uh, directories where they can, um, if they want to get those soft deletes or figure out what was deleted, they can look at those. But the snapshot itself will ma either mask it in the virtual one or not emit it in the full snapshot. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.